Okay, so we'll get started. Um, make sure my mic is working. La, 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 la. Yep, working. Um, so last time we proved Morera's theorem, which states that if you have a continuous um, function of a complex variable on a, a domain U, such that the um, integral around a rectangle, the complex integral, of course, f of z dz, for, is equal to zero for every closed rectangle parallel to the coordinate axes, then f of z is holomorphic with continuous um, derivative. Right? So um, the proof of it's actually not that hard if you just don't muddle the, the picture like I did last time. Right? If you just look at the notes and follow the picture, it's really not, not too bad. Um, so now we're taking the next step in this journey, which is known as uh, Gorsas theorem. And um, like I've said before, Gorsas theorem is really, really um, almost, I don't know what the right word is, it is at least disrespected by, by, uh, by Gamelin's book. <laughs> so in, in the sense that he has, he has forced continuity of the derivative into his definition of what he calls analytic. So like he assumes continuity of the derivative in his definition of complex differentiable. Um, it, he assumes continuity of the derivative as a function, right, in his definition of analytic, um, which to me is, well, I, I, I think it's a little distasteful. That's why I haven't done that. Um, like to me, complex differentiable should just mean that the the derivative exists in the sense of the difference quotient, right? But it's not a statement about the continuity of the derivative as a function, okay? Um, that comes later, that's a theorem, and that's the theorem we're about to prove. So, um, at least in a certain context here, Gorsas theorem. And this is Gamelin's version of Gorsas theorem. Because I think the usual version of Gorsas theorem actually kind of combines Morera's theorem and Gorsas theorem into a single statement. So he's kind of like, pulled it apart into two theorems. Um, so I, I'm just trying to say that um, I don't remember Gorsas' theorem being quite said this way in my own complex course. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is you put these two things together, sometimes they might be. That's not the right way to say it anyway. Hey, let me go on here. f of z is a complex valued function. Anyway, you guys don't care what's called the Gorsas' theorem in different books, so let me just get on with it here. Complex valued function. Um, on a domain D, it's a domain, remember open connected set, right, such that F prime of Z naught equal to the limit as Z goes to Z naught of F of Z minus F of Z naught divided by Z minus Z naught, right, exists at each z naught in D, then f of z is analytic on D. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna put some quotes around that because that's not really, I mean, that's what Gamelin says, but what he really means by that, <clears throat> then what? So I, 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 fr frankly, I would like to cross this out and go then, then f of z has f prime of z continuous on d. The point is that the derivative exists and it's continuous. Okay. Now, before I dive into the proof of this, I want to show you why this is special to complex analysis. So it's important for us to understand how this fails in the real category, right? So why special? Why is it special? Because if we look at f of x equal to, let's say, um, x, absolute value of x, right? What is this thing? This thing is minus x squared for x less than or equal to zero, and it's x squared for x greater than or equal to zero, right? 
Um, and let's see here. So what's this graph look like? It's a quadratic, right? It's like this, and then it's like that. So it, it, to the casual observer, it would look like a cubic, right? But it's not. What's the derivative of f prime of, what's f prime of x in this case? Minus 2x and 2x, right? And you notice that we don't lose 0 because what, I mean, there's a formula for this, right? This is actually 2 times the absolute value of x. See that? So there you go. That's y equals f prime. Right? Um, what's f prime prime? Well, it's it's actually, um, I mean, for what it's worth, it's it, it's minus two two like that, right? X less than zero, x greater than zero. The point is the the second derivative. Um, it does what? It's down here at minus 2, right? And then it jumps like that, right? So my, 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 my point in this example is just that we can have a, a, a real differentiable function, right? <clears throat> Which is everywhere differentiable, right? And the derivative is also everywhere continuous, right? This is a, this is a continuously differentiable function, right? And yet, it's not twice differentiable, right? Because, well, <clears throat> as you can see, the derivative doesn't exist at 0. The second derivative doesn't exist at 0, right? So if you put together this statement with Cauchy's generalized integral formula um, and the other theorems that we've looked at, what, what they imply is that if you have one complex derivative, right? Then you have a second one, you have a third one, and so forth. And more than that, they're all continuous, right? Once you know Gorsas' theorem, you know that if you have a complex derivative, it's a continuous function. Um, so then the second derivative is also continuous, and, and so forth and so on. Um, so square that against this, right? Well, in other words, this kind of example cannot be given for complex functions, right? Um, Cauchy's generalized integral formula. <coughs> basically forbids this kind of example. Because again, if we have once complex differentiable, we have twice complex differentiable, and so forth and so on. So and I'll try to explain that more, but I, I should focus on... Um, why do you move the Here? Yeah. Because there's a corner in the graph of the derivative. Uh, yeah. Um, so by the way, you can, um, you know, this, this example you often see in Calculus 1, given as an example of a function which is continuous but not differentiable, right? So because if you just have absolute value, I mean, if you just strip off the x and have absolute value of x, we know that's continuous but not differentiable because it's got a corner at 0, right? If you wanted a function which was, um, you know, just that it was twice differentiable but not thrice differentiable, all you do is take this and multiply by x squared instead of x. So like you can create an example here which fails to be differentiable at zero of arbitrary order by just multiplying whatever power of x you like times absolute value of x. So, well, can you go back to Cal and explain why that corner is so complex? Is it, is it because it's not smooth at that point? Cal right, because the, the left and the right derivatives don't agree. You know, uh -huh. you, you, you would have a tangent line with slope 1 coming from this side. Yeah. You'd have a tangent line with slope, um, well, excuse me, slope 2 coming from this side and slope minus 2 coming from the left. You know, so yeah. All right, so proof of Gorsas theorem. Proof. So we let um, we let R be a closed rectangle in D. So here's my 
here's my D. It could have some holes in it, whatever. So here's D. Open connected set, right? And we let R be a closed rectangle in D. So maybe this is R, okay? R be a closed rectangle in D, all right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to divide R into four identical sub-rectangles, all right? Okay? So let's think about that. We divide R into four identical sub-rectangles. There's your four identical sub-rectangles, all right? And we let R1 be sub-rectangle for which the integral around the boundary of that rectangle, right, um, of the modulus, well, you see the f of z dz, the modulus of this integral is what? Largest. among the four rectangles, all right? You guys with me so far? So for the sake of following this argument, let's make my picture reflect the idea. So maybe it's in this upper right-hand corner, all right? So this is, maybe this is my R1, okay? Now let's see here, what, are the, what is the assumptions of the theorem? f of z is complex valued function on a domain d, right, such that the derivative exists at each point, right? So what does that say, among other things? You remember, differentiable implies continuous at the point, right? Um, continuity of the function, mind you. So continuity of the function, certainly we have enough, um, if we know f of z is continuous, that means it has continuous component functions which means that when you break down this integral, we're looking at the level of real notation. It's a, uh, it's, it's a real, it's a complex linear combination of real integrals, right? I mean, each one of these rectangles is formed by four line segments. And so the integrals that underlie the complex integration here are definitely defined because you're just integrating continuous functions over finite, um, you know, finite line segments. Definitely this makes sense, right? And you got four of them. So you can definitely pick a largest one, right? So this is, this is a reasonable thing that you can do. All right, then what? Um, well, we make an observation here, which is that, notice, what's the relation um, of the integral around, let's see here. Notice that the integral over the boundary of R1, right, um, of f of z dz, so the modulus of that is greater than or equal to 1 fourth times the integral over the boundary of the whole rectangle we started with, right, um, f of z dz. Can you guys tell me why that is? Uh, it's, it's, it's something less fancy than that. Think about it. Uh, we're, we're saying that the R1, we're picking to be what? It's the one for which the value of that integral is largest, right? If they were all equal, then you'd have four times, if, if all of these were equal, is it the ML theorem? I don't think so. Um, you might be right.
okay, so let me think about that for just a second here. How, how, does, how is the integral, fine, I, I guess you're, I mean, all right, let me, let me break down the logic here. So if, if this is R, right, we can think of this as being equal to, in terms of the integration, right, that would be equal to the integration where you have the, you know, so the outer, outer edge is what, uh, counterclockwise oriented, so like this, like this, like this, like that, right? And so stick with this, right? And then I can add cross cuts, see? I can add this one and this one if I make them go in opposite directions, right? So just if I add the integral along the, um, the horizontal bisector in both directions, if I add both of those integrals, integral over both of those curves, then we haven't changed the overall integral, right? And if I do the, if I also add, you know, these, these, these ones here, right? If I also add the vertical cross cuts, um, let's see here, think about the, this one going this way, this one going that way, then I still haven't changed the integral, right? But if you look at what you could parse it up into, what do you got once you got that? You got, you could parse that, you could parse this integral into this one, this one, this one, and this one. I'm just drawing them a little bit easier. So like here, notice that each one of these See that? Cool. See how that works? So literally, the integral over the boundary of R of F dz is equal to the integral over the boundary of R, I don't know, for FDZ plus the integral over the boundary of R3 FDZ plus the integral over the boundary of R2 F of Z DZ. Good grief, I was just trying to do FDZ. So this detail is missing in my notes, by the way. Just for you guys today. So I'm, I'm calling this one R1, you know, R2, R3, R4, right? So there's, there's, there's no ML theorem here at all, right? This is just straight taking the curve and adding in cross cuts and breaking it into um, sub-integrals around sub -rect I mean, anyway, this is just Calc 3, really. So then triangle inequality. We can apply the triangle inequality to this, right? This, the modulus of this, right? is equal to the modulus of all that, right? But the triangle inequality says that that's less than or equal to what? Modulus of the first one plus the modulus of the second one plus the modulus of the third one plus the modulus of the fourth one, right? And if R1 is the largest of all these, right? If this one's the largest of all these, then certainly this is less than or equal to four times the integral, modulus of the integral around R1 of F dz, right? So that's why that's true. So no, I guess it, it is not the ML theorem. It, it really is just calc three and the triangle inequality. Um, okay, so if you can do this once, what can you do? You can, yeah, you can do it again, right? So let's repeat this process on R1, right? Take R1 and divide R1 into four subrectangles, right? And let's let R2, can I erase this for the sake of, okay. I mean, I can just move to the other board, it's fine. I'll, I'll just move to the other board once we, it's fine. Let me, let me do the next step here. So then um, let R2 be 
subrectangle of R1 such that the modulus of the integral over R2, um, and, and my bad. See, now I've got to mess up. The, my, my labeling has now got me into trouble. Let me put some tildes on these to get myself out of trouble. Tilde, 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 tilde. Because these are not the R, this is not the R2 that's down here. This R2 is whichever one of these, um, and a, w w whatever subrectangle of R1 is, is largest, right? So Jade, you, you get to pick. Do you, which one do you want it to be? Uh, one, two, three, or four? Two. two, okay. So let's suppose it's here then. So this is R2. Right? And then what do we have? We have that the integral, um, let's see here, I've lost track of my, so the integral um, over the boundary of R1 um, of F dz would be less than or equal to 4 times the modulus of the integral over R2 of F dz. By the same argument we just went through for R, at R at, in the same way R1 relates to R and the same way R2 relates to R1. You know, it's like they're the same nesting. So what does this tell us? So the, 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 the modulus of the integral over the boundary of R, ah, grief. the integral over the boundary of R of F dz, F of z dz, is less than or equal to 4 squared times the integral, modulus of the integral over boundary of R2, right? So putting together, putting, you know, Basically, taking this guy right here, right, and putting it into here, I get to that. So I think you see what we're going to do next. What are we going to do? We're going to do this again, but subdividing R2 into four rectangles, right? So maybe in R2, um, you get this one is the, the integral. So R3 is in here, you know? That would be R3. And that's pretty much all I can draw since I made that, that given the size of my drawing, that's where I get stuck in terms of illustrating it here. But you, you see this process can continue indefinitely, right? And so every time we pick the subrectangle on which the integral, the modulus of the integral over the subrectangle is largest, right? And so continuing in this fashion, what do we have? Have the, the uh, the modulus of the integral over the boundary of R, f of z dz, is going to be what? It's going to be less than or equal to 4 to the power n, right, of the um, nth subdivided rectangle. So how does this help us? <laughs> well, let's think about this. So what we have is um, We have this, this is, you know, coming from looking at the nesting, R contains R1, contains R2, contains dot dot dot, contains Rn, right? Um, so, as n goes to infinity, you can see that there exists z naught in D um, contained 
in all, all of these rectangles, right? I mean, you can kind of picture it in my picture, right? It's, it's somewhere in this R3, right? And as, 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 the, as you keep dividing, you're, you're going to be zooming in, basically, on a point, right? Um, and let's see here. I don't think I have said... Um, but, okay, yeah, let's continue here. I'm trying to be careful with my notes. My notes is at some points will we'll include, will introduce a new um, a variable. I want to make sure I'm doing it justice here. So let's let L be the, let's see here, is it the perimeter or is it the length of the side? I think it's the perimeter. Um, is where to go. L is the length of the perimeter of R. Right? Then what's the length of then what's the length of the boundary of is what? What would the length of the, let's see here, maybe we can figure it out from just a picture, right? So here's R, right? And let's suppose this one is R1. So um, if, if L is equal to like what, 2W? plus um, 2h, let's say. So I suppose this is L and this is h. So that's the, that gives you the perimeter of the boundary of R, right? If you look at the subrectangle, what's the length of the sides of the subrectangle? Yeah, this h over 2, right? L over 2, little l over 2. Excuse me. Why did I use? I meant w. My bad. Trying to avoid W, I was trying to use, avoid using the L again, W over 2. And so it's what? So the, the boundary of R1 has 2 times H over 2 plus 2 times W over 2 as a perimeter, right? So it's H plus W, which is what? Which is L over 2, right? So when we get to, well, the R1 has half the length of the perimeter of the original one, right? Um, so it's kind of funny thing. Um, quartering, quartering the rectangle only halves the perimeter. Um, and so the length of the boundary of N is just L over 2 to the N. All right? Is that clear? I hope that's clear. And... Um, well, what else have we assumed? We've assumed f of z is complex differentiable at z naught, right? f prime of z naught exists, right? Thus, we have the following estimate. We can write f of z minus f of z naught over z minus z naught, right? Minus f prime of z naught, and we can make that less than or equal to epsilon n, right? Thus, for each for each z in the boundary of n, there exists epsilon n greater than zero such that this happens. So, and that, that's reasonable, right? Because the boundary of Rn is 
um, you know, close to Z0, right? So that means that we can make the value of the difference quotient sufficiently, as close as we like, to the value of the derivative for such points, right? Um, hence what? Hence the modulus of f of z minus f of z naught minus f prime of z naught times z minus z naught, all right, is less than or equal to epsilon n times the modulus of z minus z naught. And I say that that is less than or equal to, uh, so I'm, I'm very uh, I'm very generous here. I just say uh, 2 epsilon n times L over 2 to the n. So the last inequality is very generous since z naught and z are in Rn surely implies that they're closer than the perimeter L2 or n apart. Right, I mean, so the picture is like this, right? So you've got this box, Rn. And in that box, you've got z. I mean, z could be on the edge of it, I don't know. z not somewhere inside, probably, right? I think it has to be, actually. And um, so well, if you... You're just, you're just putting and cutting and cutting until you get increments up to the close to that point. Well, yeah, that's... that's What's, that's essentially the nature of this argument, yeah. But um, notice, like, so this modulus of z minus z naught is the distance from z here. It's this distance, right? So is that, I mean, I, this is, I don't need the 2 in front, right? <laughs> I mean, certainly the distance between a point inside a rectangle and a point on its edge is not more than the perimeter. Yeah. That's, that's overly generous. I don't even need, I don't think I even need this 2 here, but... It's there. I'm going to leave it there. I'm not sure why it's there. I'm, we could erase that, too. It wouldn't hurt things. I'm just leaving it there because, well, eh, let's see what, see if I've got it there for a reason. Maybe not. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. All right. So, also, what else can we say? Well, notice... G of z, so I'm, I'm defining G of z here, G of z equal to f of z naught plus f prime of z naught times z minus z naught. So look, w w tell me what is the deal with this function? What kind of function are we looking at? We're looking at a function which is um, polynomial centered at z naught. It's got a constant, a given constant, right? We know z naught exists here, so this is a given constant. We know f prime of z naught exists, that's a given constant, and this is z minus z naught. So this is just a function of z. Is it, um, is it differentiable? I mean, yeah, it's differentiable. What, what's, its, what's its primitive? So g of z would be what? Uh, you could use z times f of z naught, right? plus f prime of z naught over 2, z minus z naught squared. That would differentiate to g, right? That's a primitive. I think that's the first time I've thrown a marker into a trash can since I've been here. It feels good. It feels good. What? Well, I haven't. I, I've been off my game. There's not enough trash cans. and. I don't go through markers fast enough here because I'm using, you know, I'm, you know. You'll have to give me lessons on being cool, Audric. It's not really. No? Oh. Curses. Well, I'm, I, I'm lost. I have no. Jade, can you help me? Oh, man. Rats. So, um, <laughs> the point is. What was one of our theorems? One of our theorems was that if, um, if a function has a primitive, right, over a rectangle, 
then that means the function is what? Holomorphic on the rectangle, right? And more than that, so thus, surely the integral over the boundary of the nth rectangle of g of z dz is what? I mean, that's a closed loop. That's its antiderivative. So the integral is 0, right? This is 0. How does that help us? Well, it's not obvious yet. So I said subtracting the 0 is crucial. Consider, so here we go, modulus of the integral of the boundary of Rn, f of z dz, is equal to the modulus of the integral over the boundary of Rn of what? Well, I'm going to take f of z minus f of z naught minus <clears throat> f prime of z naught times z minus z naught. So what did I do there? So what I just did was I subtracted g of z, right? That is the g of z. I, I've, so I've, I've, I've subtracted the integral of g of z from this given integral. But that's just 0, right? So. No harm, no foul. But on the other hand, oh, ho, 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 look at that. That's exactly what we had an estimate on up here. See that? That's the same expression as this. Now is the time we use the ML theorem. See, because this is, is an M for that integral. So this is less than or equal to um, 2 epsilon n L over 2 to the n. <clears throat> times what? Times the, uh, <clears throat> the, the length of Rn, right? Which was what? Remember, we, we were discussing that back up here somewhere. The length of the boundary is L over 2 to the n. Okay. And so what do we have? This is equal to? And, and, and now I'm convinced I didn't need this 2 here. So let me just erase that 2 if you guys don't mind. I'm going to cross it out. I, I don't know why I put that 2 there. It doesn't need to be there. It's not helpful. It's just a distraction. Let me cross it out. Okay. So L squared, right, over 4n, 4 to the n, times epsilon n. You got it? Okay, great. Now, finally, getting back to what we're interested in, the integral over the rectangle, right? So we have the integral over the rectangle, f of z dz, is less than or equal to, but I remember our argument over here, <coughs> excuse me, up here actually, 4 to the n times the modulus of the integral over the nth um, subdividing rectangle. Right? But we just proved that that here, this guy, is less, less than or equal to L squared over 4n times epsilon n. So this is less than or equal to 4 to the n times L squared over 4n epsilon n. So the 4 to the n's cancel, and we're just left with L squared epsilon n. Now, L is fixed. L is a finite number, characteristic of the rectangle that we picked inside this domain, right? And um, what happens as n goes to infinity? So how does this go? <laughs> no, <laughs> epsilon. No, as n goes to infinity, we can make epsilon go to 0, right? So as this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Another way of saying this, maybe, maybe a better way of saying this is 
we can make epsilon as small as we like by taking n as large as we want, all right? So the point is then, this implies, therefore what? The integral over the boundary of the rectangle of f of z dz is what? It's zero. But then what? Then Marrera's theorem says that f prime of z is continuous. So, which implies f prime of z continuous on d by Marrera's theorem. So, if I'm teaching complex analysis to engineers, I don't do these last two lectures, right? Because this is for math majors, <laughs> for sure, right? But as you can see, while it takes some effort, we have now proved that the existence of the derivative on a domain implies that that derivative as a function is continuous. But this rectangle was arbitrary. So in a domain, you can always pick a rectangle. That, yeah, good point. So that's the rest of the argument, is that in a domain, you can always pick a rectangle around any point because it's open if the edges are open, right? Yeah. So you can always w wedge a rectangle in there. And because you can always wedge that rectangle in there. Does the orientation of the rectangle matter? Um, the orientation. Well, we, we used rectangles, um, you know, uh, parallel to the coordinate axes, but that's mostly a convenience of exposition. Okay. Um, but anyway, I mean, it, if it's open, you can always fit one of these kinds of rectangles in there. Like, you don't need sideways rectangles, right? Um, I mean, maybe there exist points where, like, okay, fine. I mean, yeah, if I'm here, then I can fit a bigger sideways rectangle in there. Fair enough, right? But I can still fit a one with parallel to the coordinate axes inside. Because it's a domain. The f edges are fuzzy. This is what allows all of this. All right, so <clears throat> again, if the derivative exists in the complex sense, it has to be continuous as its own function. Now, in both complex analysis and real analysis, we always have the statement that if the derivative exists at a point, the function is continuous, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm saying something different. I'm saying if the derivative exists at a point, then the derivative function is continuous. Right, that, that's a different statement. <laughs> um, see, so if f prime of x naught exists, then the limit as x goes to x naught, f of x is equal to f of x naught. This is a theorem that we know from calculus one, right? real calculus. If the derivative exists, the function is continuous at the point where the derivative exists. But it is not necessarily that the limit as x goes to x naught of f prime of x is equal to f prime of x naught. That does not have to happen in the real category. Here's a picture of a function where that doesn't happen. Let's see here. Um, so let me just make myself some. So what, what, what you could have is you could have a function that does like this. So this could be y equals f of x, right? You can define such a function, all right? 
formulas are known for this, all right? I just I don't remember off the top of my head for sure, so I don't want to butcher it. Yeah. Such formulas exist that have this graph. That so what happens is the function is in it's it's oscillating as it gets close to zero, and yet it's going through. So this function is such that f prime of zero exists, and in fact it's zero. Okay. But what's the derivative of the red function? The derivative of this red function, it looks like um, something more like this. I'm not doing, I'm not being accurate to the the precise, you know, phase by phase interaction of the function that's derivative, obviously, right? But the point is, the derivative, see, because this function is increasing and decreasing, increasing and decreasing. Yeah. That means this derivative is going positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, as you go to zero. That, so, like, the limit as x goes to zero here of my example does not exist due to oscillation. Yet, f prime of zero is zero. This um, red function, so f of, um, f is differentiable at zero, but f prime not continuous at zero. This is an example of a function which is not continuously differentiable. So a function is continuously differentiable if it has a derivative which exists, and that derivative as a function exists continuously. Oh, it's so, uh, of course you get to zero, the oscillating is just a straight up like sharp peak, making it so. It's not this nice curve anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, essentially, it's, the reason it's undefined is because like it almost goes straight up and down at a certain point. Or it does go straight up and down at a certain point. Like the right. tangent to the line is always straight up line. Right. So what? The, um, yeah. yeah. So what we've proved today is this phenomena is, in, yeah, is impossible for complex functions. You cannot make this happen in the complex domain. The structure of the complex derivative is so nice. It's such a strong structure that it forbids this kind of thing. It cannot happen. There are many reasons why. Um, well, yeah, we just we did we did we did just prove why that's true. Um, but so um, ah, so I guess that's about it for today. So I didn't. I don't think I did a single calculation, did I? But that's the nature of this particular corner of the course. I hope you guys were able to make sense of mission five. You got questions you could ask me about it?